A modern armoured force needs to be mobile both for defence and attack, but particularly when attacking. If the defender can slow the attacker down or stop him even for a short while, he can make him present a better target, destroy him and gain time to concentrate his own forces at the critical point. The defender should therefore use a combination of natural and artificial obstacles so as to inhibit the attacker's mobility and bring his own weapons to bear under the most favourable conditions. This reconnaissance element of a combat team is demonstrating a move into a defensive location. The first thing the commander must do is to study the ground, with a view to sighting his troops in the best position to observe and cover the likely enemy approach. I see the enemy approaching from the area of that strip wood uh, over to our, our right of centre. Now, David, the main problem is going to be able to get Recky forward of that line towards Ablington Firs. Can you cover that? This map depicts the terrain that the combat team is to occupy, along with another combat team and the rest of the battle group. The natural obstacles are the woods, the river, marshland and steep slopes. Steep slopes are a useful deterrent, not only because they are hard to get up, but also because the reverse position can give the defending troops an advantage. Ditches or rivers can pose problems, and the enemy will be forced to search for a way across or around them. Marshland or swamp areas are also impassable to armour. A wood of large trees can channel the approaching vehicles onto existing tracks and so make them vulnerable and their movements predictable. Shallow rooted trees, such as pine or small trees and scrub, may seem like obstacles, but in practice this may be misleading as they are unlikely to stop tanks. Villages and towns canalize the movement of armored vehicles and like woods make them more vulnerable. Those with narrow streets are good obstacles. It is important to remember, however, that gardens or other open spaces as seen here may provide easy access. Fast moving ring roads or broad streets also provide freedom of movement unless they are blocked by some form of artificial obstacles. These natural obstacles can all be useful in directing the enemy into the desired area. It is unlikely, though, that they will all be in the right place or of the right size to suit the defence, and the commander may need to create artificial obstacles. First, he can lay minefields. He may need large tactical minefields to canalise the enemy and to block the approach routes. Then, to hinder and harass the enemy, he can lay nuisance minefields, such as on the entrance and exit of possible river crossings. To give his own position added protection, he can lay protective minefields. The roads through the woods are likely avenues of movement, so he should create additional obstacles by felling suitable trees. The bridge will need demolishing, and if time permits, he may crater the other roads. The slope on the hill to his flank may not be of sufficient steepness, so he might improve its value as an obstacle by cutting steps in it. Having decided on how he is to improve his position and discussed it with the other units involved in defending the area, he will call his troops forward to their individual locations. The sappers have already started to lay the tactical minefield across the valley and it should be between 800 and 1,000 metres deep. It must be covered by fire. Tactical minefields are always laid by the Royal Engineers. The best and quickest way to lay a number of rows of mines is by using the bar mine layer. It is a self-contained unit, normally towed by an armoured personnel carrier, which also carries a supply of mines to be laid. When laying any type of minefield, it is important to make it blend in with the surrounding terrain. Even though it might not produce nice straight lines, the contours of the ground should be followed. 
and any crop lines or changes in land color used to disguise the location and thus surprise the enemy. Closer to the defended position, a protective minefield is being laid by the infantry. The sighting of this has to be close enough to the troops' position to be within range of their own anti-tank weapons. It should be about 200 meters deep, and where possible, the mine should be dug in to assist camouflage. In small or difficult areas, nuisance minefields can be laid. Once the minefield has been completed, precautions should be taken against enemy troops breaching the minefield by hand or attacking on foot, so anti-personnel mines are laid. The Ranger anti-personnel mine launcher system provides a rapid means of doing this. Other obstacles are produced by demolitions, the blowing of bridges, the demolition of buildings, the collapsing of tunnels, and in this case, the cratering of the approach road through the wood. If the rapid cratering kit is available, it should be used, though frequently one will have to resort to the camouflage method. A tube is driven into the ground to form a hole. It is removed and into the hole is lowered about half a kilogram of explosive, which is sufficient to create a chamber. A larger quantity of explosive, about 30 kilograms, is then placed in the chamber and detonated. The crater formed needs to be improved by the addition of anti-tank and anti-personnel mines. The approach through the forest can also be limited by cutting selected trees so that they block any tracks. And by leaving the stumps about three quarters of a meter high so that if a tank does drive over them, it will belly and be stopped. If there is a chance that the attacking troops may dismount, then barbed wire laid between the trees will be a hazard. The digging of anti-tank ditches may be a practical proposition in some instances particularly when a suitable machine, such as the Sapper's Combat Engineer tractor, is available. It is an additional hazard if the ditches can be flooded, but they need to be five meters wide and at least one and a half meters deep with vertical sides.
In some places, the ground lends itself to being cut into anti-tank steps, which must be at least two meters high to be effective. If they are not, then this could happen. Let us therefore summarize the obstacles that might be available to the commander. Firstly, he must consider natural obstacles of the woods, river, ditches, marshland, and steep slopes. To improve the strength of his position, he may also decide to use some artificial obstacles. Woods are not in themselves obstacles, unless the trees are of sufficient bulk and density. To be an effective deterrent, they should be at least half a meter thick. If they are not, then they can be built into a large wall in a herringbone type pattern, with the tops of the trees facing the enemy. Any stumps left need to be about three quarters of a meter high. Craters can also be added to block the tracks through the woods and mines must be sown round the perimeter. Next, steps and slopes. Steps to be of any real use should be at least two meters high. And ditches need to be five meters wide and at least one and a half meters deep with vertical sides. It should be remembered that steep slopes and steps cause the tank to present a good target of its belly to our anti-armor weapons covering the obstacles. Minefields. First, there is the tactical minefield. The tactical minefield is laid by Royal Engineers. Its aim is to delay or harass the enemy initially, to canalize him and frequently to contain him in the killing area. The depth of tactical minefields should be between 800 and 1,000 meters. Then there is the nuisance minefield. The nuisance minefield is useful for harassing the enemy in areas that are not always observed and covered by fire. Without laying any live mines, a phony minefield can be marked out to confuse the enemy. And lastly, the protective minefield. The protective minefield is normally laid by the defending troops for their close protection and is tied to natural obstacles. Its depth is normally about 200 meters. In order to counter the enemy's mobility, we must make maximum use of obstacles, both natural and artificial. But obstacles should not be used in isolation. They are an essential component of the defense and will only be effective if employed within the framework of the formation battle and fire plan and must exploit the existing natural features and blend in with the terrain. <laughs> 